Welcome to a time together with you. I just want you to know how much we do miss you. This is a very different context than which I'm used to. Um, please be patient with us because we're kind of on a learning curve right here right now. Uh, I would like to, to thank my production manager, Lori, for uh, her creativity in making this possible. We looked a lot of YouTube things just to try to to bring this message to you. Like I said, we, we, we really miss you. This is this is not ideal, but I'm thankful for this technology that we can at least communicate in this small way. Um, as we move forward, things may change as to how we do this. Uh, hopefully it'll get better as we move along. But having said that, what I want to do for the next few weeks is take some ideas and principles out of Jeremiah 29, 11, which is a passage that I think is most uh, familiar to many of you. Uh, I'm titling it Encouragement from God During Life's Discouraging Moments. And I think we can say that this is one of those times that we can easily become discouraged and begin to look too horizontally and not enough vertically. What I would like to do is just read you the text right now that we'll be looking at. And this is just introductory stuff for this, this morning. There were some tough times that Israel was going through, some really tough times. And we're going to see that in this passage. I'm going to read it. And we'll pray, and then we'll, we'll move forward. Jeremiah 29, starting with verse 1. I'm going to read the first 14 verses in this particular passage. These are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders of the exiles. And to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile, from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jehoiachin. And the queen mother, eunuchs, the officials of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen, the metal workers, had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the land hand of Elisa, the son of Shaphan, and Gerira the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Here's what it said. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. And pray to the Lord on his behalf for its welfare. You will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for wholeness. Another word that can be inserted in there is plans for your shalom. Plans for your peace. And not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me. And when you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back 
to the place from which I sent you into exile. Father, I pray for this time that we would be gleaning much from your word, that we'll receive many applicational principles here when we look at how infinite you are and how finite we are. I pray that as we move through this passage over the next few weeks that we will come away with a confidence of being encouraged because of who you are and that we're not discouraged by the circumstances that surround us. May we call out to you as blessed. May we recognize that you are the sovereign over all things, that there is nothing beyond your care, there's nothing beyond your concern, and there's nothing beyond your power. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In this letter, I think the first thing that we need to understand here is that the historical environment in which this passage was written. Don't forget that this was written. We never should forget to whom this passage is written to. And as I said, it's Israel themselves. But then on the other hand, we must know and understand that for whom is it written? And it's for you, it's for me, that we should be able to take out of this passage great encouraging principles concerning how God takes care of his own children. Now, as it reads right here, this is a letter of Jeremiah to the captives in Babylon. But within it is coupled together with some bad teaching that the people are receiving from false prophets. One of the things that I find in this is so interesting is that when you begin to encounter circumstances in life, that there will always be those people that will give you false hope. And therefore, we must be discerning the things that we listen to, the things that we hear. And that's what Jeremiah is saying. That's what God is saying. He's saying, don't listen to those people because you see, there are some prophets out there saying, you'll only be there for two years. You won't be in this circumstance for very long. But then God comes back and says, oh no, I said they'd be for there for 70 years. And that's what now Jeremiah is reiterating. And he wants them to get settled in to this new environment, this new circumstance that they're going through. Let me give you just a little bit of the historical background here. It was in 597 BC that about 3,000 Jews were exiled, including the king. There were priests, there were prophets, there were people from the royal household of some being Daniel and his three buddies. And during this period, there was much unrest among the captives. All over the Babylonian Empire, the people were really becoming discouraged. And God is now coming to them through Jeremiah to encourage them. As I've already said, there were many self-proclaimed false prophets. They were both in Jerusalem and Babylon, preaching that the captivity would be short-lived. Two years. It just wasn't true. God had to remind the people that he did not stutter when he said 70 years. And they needed to understand that. So what we have here, Jeremiah, upon hearing of this false teaching, he begins, he begins to write and he warns the ex ex exiles about this deception. And he, now he is urging them to wait patiently for God's time and timing one of the things that I find interesting in this passage is that here these people are in dire circumstances. Here they're exiled into captivity. They now would be considered slaves. But Paul is saying just because your circumstances have changed doesn't mean you stop living. You stop, don't stop engaging in what you're doing. It's sort of like this, this virus here. Uh, we're kind of quarantined off, but that doesn't mean we stop living. It doesn't mean we, don't, we stop doing the things that God has called us to do. So this is what we're learning, some of the principles, principles we're learning here. I want to give you just three immediate type of principles or lessons we can learn from this particular passage, and we're going to delve into a little bit more deeply as, over the next few weeks. And the first is this. Be careful 
and be discerning who you listen to. It is easy to get distracted. It's easy to get misled if you're not discerning enough to be able to know what is true and what is not true. What is really what God has said rather than what man has said. I think it's John MacArthur who said that unfortunately in the evangelical circle today, the mark of discernment is sorely lacking. That we seem to easily attach ourselves to any kind of thought that may be of advantage to us rather than really evaluating is this really true. We're, we're experiencing that today in, in, in some of the media that we receive information, oh no, they're going to do this and do this, and all of a sudden we find out it's not true. So therefore we must be discerning in what we hear, be discerning in what someone is saying. But the second thing is this, in this whole passage, and that is trust in the sovereign work of God, knowing that He has a plan, and He has chosen you and me to be in that plan. I mean, if you just look at the passage here. For thus says the Lord, 70 years, that's when this will be over. The trustworthiness of God's voice, that eventually they will be out of this mess. In fact, it is these very words from Jeremiah that Daniel was reading when he was in captivity, and that is what gave him hope that they were nearing the end and that they would return. Some would return back to Jerusalem. If you wanted to give a small outline here as far as verses 11 through 14 is this. The first is this, know that God has a plan. We'll look at that next week. But secondly, in this passage, it also says he has a promise. He says that when you call on me, and when you come and pray to me, look what it says, I will hear you. Then he says, you will seek me and find me. And when you do that, I will be found. And I will restore. Now, there's the plan. There's the promise. You seek me. I will be found. You don't have to be desperate. I'm not hiding. But there's a precondition to this that is something that can be easily overlooked. He says, I have a plan for you. I have a promise I'm giving to you. But there's a precondition. You being sold out to God. How are we to be seeking Him? How are we to be pursuing God? And he says it with your whole heart. Seek me with everything that is within you. And you will begin to see the greatness of the infinite working of God in your life, in our life. But there's a third thing here, of which we're expanding on. So the first thing is this. Be careful. Be discerning about what you read and what you hear. Making sure you sift it through the grid of God's word to know what is true and what is not. Trust in the sovereign work of God. Trust knowing that he has a plan for you. But thirdly, understand this, and we're seeing it right here. God will often cast us completely adrift and take away what I call <clears throat> our security blankets in life. What's a security blanket? Well, you've seen little kids with security blankets, right? You've seen them carry it, drag it around the house and, and it gets all dirty and ratty-tatty, but it's their security. It's the thing that keeps them calm. It keeps them focused. But have you ever noticed how when you take that away and when mom decides to wash the security blanket, <laughs> the, your child becomes very distressed and he's waiting for that security blanket to come back to him. And so 
he, he waits, it's going through the wash, and then the dryer, he's watching the dryer, and he's seen it going around and around and around, and finally the door opens and out comes, and oh, what relief there now is, because he's got a security blanket back. Uh, it, I think that's something like God does to us. We walk around with our security blankets. We think that we live in the land of plenty. We have monetary means and Sometimes we begin to treat that like our security blanket. We begin to, we look at our houses. That becomes our security blanket. We look at our health and we become, begin to think that because I'm in such good health, that's my security blanket. Everything is right. Everything is good. And sometimes God takes away that security blanket to teach us a lesson. All those that, things that we depended upon that we regarded as essential to our well-being, sometimes God will remove it. If you look at verse 7, one of the things you can see there is I call this the loss, where God will bring loss into our life. Here, look at Israel. There's a loss of a nation state. There's, there's a loss of identity. There's a loss of that, that reality that are we really God's chosen? There's a loss of kingship. Kingship meaning the security of a ruler, the security of somebody who's going to hold everything together. He's gone. The security of an army. I mean, how many times do we hear on television today where we have the mightiest army around? That can sometimes lend itself to thinking that's our security blanket because nobody can touch us. It's just not true. And Israel came into that confrontation that God took away the security blanket of their army. He destroyed them. They had nothing left. He then, there's a loss of the national borders. There's no longer any border to identify this Israel. But most importantly for them, they lost their temple. They lost the very security blanket that they thought would be there forever. Because with that loss, they began to think that God disappeared. And then they begin to wonder, why, why would you take away even your temple from us? Why would you take away our security blankets? And let me give you two reasons why I think this may be so. Often is to give us a new perspective on who he is and how he operates in our life. But secondly, he gives us a new understanding that he has everything under control. Don't worry, trust me, he is saying. So in this passage here, we're finding that the first thing that we must do is think vertically, not horizontally. For if we begin by looking at things horizontally, it will weaken our trust in the vertical relationship that we're to have. We must look vertically through the prism of his greatness and sovereignty and then allow ourselves to look out horizontally, seeing that he is in all of our circumstances, and even without our security blanket, we can still feel secure. But what happens, though? What happens if we fail to trust God, to trust Him in everything that He said He would do for us? Again, I think there's two things that we can think about here. And it's the naturalness of our humanity that we, we deal with here. And the first is this, if God doesn't measure up to our expectations, if God doesn't measure up to, to what we're desiring from him, and he takes away the things that make us feel secure, I think the first thing that will develop within us is a bit of resentment towards him. How dare you, God, take this away from me? It's as if we believe that we deserve all of these blessings. And we, we begin to believe that, that God owes us something. And so I think we begin to develop this, this resentment. 
And it begins to show itself in our relationships with other people. It begins to show itself in, in our emotions. Some of us will get depressed. Some of us will get angry. Some of us will get all varied kinds of, of attitudes out of this. And, we, we, and the reason for that <clears throat> excuse me, is because we're looking at God through the prism of our horizontal eyes and then looking up vertically and it's all skewed. It's messed up. We're out of focus. But then there's a second thing that I think happens to us <clears throat> if we fail to trust God. And it's this. We're going to lose confidence in God's ability to take care of us. We're going to lose confidence in His ability in such a way that we'll begin to believe that we need to change His character in order to make us more comfortable with our circumstances. We'll take the infinite God and pare him down to a finite level. Let me illustrate that. Some of you remember, I've, I've mentioned this book before, when bad, you know, why do bad things happen to good people? And the assumption is, is that people are good, for one. But it's written by this rabbi, Rabbi Kushner. What were, what's the context? This is just going to be a short, what's the context? It's where Rabbi Kushner lost his young son. His son died. He began to question the character of God. He began, to, he began to lose confidence in God. And the short story of it is this. He came to the conclusion that obviously God didn't know his son was going to die. Obviously God was not in control. Obviously God's plan got all messed up. You see, what Kushner had to do in order to satisfy his own angst was he had to change the character of God to make himself feel settled in life. The problem is it never does and it never will. What kind of God is that? It is no God at all. That's why I said what he did is he took the infinite and pared him down into the finite and then he treated God like a wax nose. So what Jeremiah wants us to realize in and through all of life, and it's this, <clears throat> God has a plan for us. He has a plan for you. He has a plan for me. And here's the catch. That plan exists whether we see it or not. What we see in this passage is that we are included in God's work in our life. And not only in our life, but in our future. Like Israel, the Christian life is this. It's a, it's a series of, I believe, new beginnings, new challenges, new uncertainties, and new stresses. Did we expect what we see happening today? No. These are new challenges. We are uncertain about what is going on. And now we're under some new stress. No doubt some of you, like Israel of old, are, could be in the middle of this whole angst. Maybe you're beginning to wonder, does God really have a plan? Well, God says he does. He says, he have, I have a wonderful plan, whether you see it or not. No doubt some of you, like I said, are in this, in the middle of something. But you mean, need to understand here is this, that God has everything under control. Even though it seems to you there's nothing redeemable about our circumstances, there's nothing redemptive about what's going on, you need to understand that there is. Because of who God is. In fact, some of you will go through life. There will be times, those low times, that not just what we're dealing with here, but there will be times, low times, where you're going to be doubting your purpose in life. Why am I here? What's my purpose? What's my calling? Understand this. God has a plan. And He has called you into that plan to be used. God will use you for His glory and your good. 
Yes, so, if you're in a doubtful mode, then this text is for you. It's written for you. It's the kind of passage that ought to be an encouragement to you during discouraging times. I want to kind of give you just a taste of what we're going to be looking at next week. What are God's plans anyway? And I just want to hit just the first point because there's going to be four underneath that and we'll look at that next time. But I want you to be encouraged by these final remarks here. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. And he goes on. The first thing I want you to see is this. God's plan for you is complete. And because you know that, it ought to bring great comfort to you. Look at that phrase. I know the plans I have for you. What does this indicate? What is this telling us? It, God is saying, my plans are exhaustive, extensive, and all-inclusive. It's an all-inclusive scope of his plan for you. It's huge. And the thing of it is, is he knows it, he comprehends it, he knows all about it. Let me give you kind of a paraphrase, and I'm going to read two texts as I close. It's this. It's an opening promise. His plans are wholly known and comprehended by him. And the word I in there is emphatic. Which suggests this. It's God speaking to you. I, you do not know the plans I have for you. This is God speaking. You don't know the plans I have for you. That's okay. And you may not think in your situation that anybody can know your circumstances and situation. How can they know? And God is coming and he's reaffirming himself to you. He is saying, but I know the plans I have for you. It doesn't matter whether you know them or not. That's not the issue. It's to find comfort in knowing that God specifically to you has a plan that's going to bring goodness to us and glory to him. Let me end with these two encouraging verses. The one is found in Isaiah 55, 9. The other is Psalm 77, 19. There it reads, Isaiah, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I don't think we should ever forget that. Don't ever think that you can think greater thoughts than God. Impossible. But there's a second thing here, and I think it's really neat. Psalm 77, 19. Your path led through the sea. Your way through the mighty waters. This is God. God, your path led through the sea. Your way through the mighty waters. Love this. Though your footprints were not seen. What a way of knowing it to have confidence. Even though you cannot see the footprints of God, know this. God is still with you. He still is fulfilling his plan in you. May God richly add a blessing to our time. Let me pray. Father, I'm so grateful that we can spend just a few minutes in your word. I hope this has been an encouragement to each one that has watched this video. And I also pray that they'd be encouraged knowing that nothing happens in life that you have not allowed. And that when he takes away our, you take away our little security blankets, it's with a greater purpose in mind. And that is to trust you for our security and not the things around us. We pray this to your glory. We pray this in your mighty name. Amen.